Hello and welcome to the latest episode in our ESMO extravaganza for 2023. I'm Michael Fernando, that is Josh Hurwitz, and today we are talking about biliary and upper GI cancers. As usual, this is probably going to be a shorter episode, certainly compared to our Breast and GU episodes, but it is no less interesting. Josh, how are you doing today? Most excellent. And Michael, it is no less interesting. The articles we have today are potentially groundbreaking and practice changing with some controversy mixed in a little bit like the bold and the beautiful. So why don't we just hit the ground running? Let's hit the ground running with Josh's absolute favorite class of drugs in the whole world. That's FGFR inhibitors in the treatment of biliary cancer. Take it away, Josh. Yeah, so tinangotinib is the name of our new drug and FGFR contender, and it is a trial looking at the advanced fibroblast growth factor receptor inhibitors in those that are refractory or relapse in cholangiocarcinomas, a notoriously difficult cancer to treat. And I just have very strong memories from my early career where everyone that came in had obstructive jaundice and essentially I couldn't treat at all. So I'm very, very much invested in this cancer type. The background is that FGFR alterations occur in 15% of patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma and pemigatinib, infogatinib and futibatinib are first generation FGFR2 fusion rearrangement drugs which have been FDA approved in the cholangiocarcinoma space. What they found is that 67% of patients treated with these inhibitors develop acquired resistance. And so the question is, what do you do next? And I also have the answer. And the answer is tenigotinib, which has unique binding to FGFR2, overcoming acquired resistance mutations. It's got a small structure. It has a high binding affinity due to three hydrogen bond interactions with the protein, and it has active conformation binding. So these are the results from three initial clinical trials where two were, well, one was a phase one and two were sort of a phase one B slash phase two. So about 89 patients in total. And what they found, if you go across the breakdown of these mutations, tinagotinib is actually far more able to target these resistant mutations. So classic conclusion criteria, you've got to be old enough to be involved, You had to have advanced or surgically unresectable cholangia who received at least one prior line of chemotherapy and FGFR altered and wild type patients were also included and you had to have measurable disease. Looking at the demographics in their 60s with a predominance towards females and very much predominance towards Caucasian patients, about 80%. And 54% had an ECOG of one. When looking at the prior therapies, Michael, and I think it shows how fast people progress, 48% had three plus lines of chemotherapy and 39% had one prior FGFR inhibitor and 8% had two prior FGFR inhibitors. When you look at the breakdown of what was the analysis of the FGFR mutation, so 38% had a fusional rearrangement, 32% had a mutation, 1% had an amplification, and 44% was wild type. This is somewhat important because these these drugs don't target all of these different types of FGFR lesions the same. When you look at the safety analysis, and what's kind of exciting, and I haven't got to the outcome, is that the outcomes, the, the the safety analysis has improved, meaning it's gone from the terrible nail toxicities that they saw previously and hyperphosphatemia and dry eyes to more traditional toxicities of chemotherapy, which maybe I shouldn't be excited, but things like hypertension we can manage, stomatitis we can manage, diarrhea I can manage, PPE, so PAMA, plantar erythematosus we can manage, and nausea I can manage. Whereas the nail tox can be quite debilitating from what I hear. So this is somewhat exciting. Look at the out, Looking at the outcomes, there's a three breakdown here. So the first breakdown was the FGFR2 altered subgroup. The second was the FGFR refractory subgroup. And the third was those with a new kinase domain mutation, which is where this new drug targets. So what they found in those that had an altered mutation, the objective response rate was 29%. Um, the combined sort of clinical benefit was 42% and the DCR was up to 90%. Michael, how's that sounding so far? 
It's sounding pretty good so far, Josh. I can see why you like these drugs so much. Exactly. I really like this drug, especially with the disease control rate so high. When you look at the patients who had known sort of refractory prior FGFR exposure, again, the disease control rate was 92%. The objective response rate was 31%. And the combined sort of clinical benefit was 44%. And those that had the kinase mutation or the KD kinase domain mutation, we saw something even more startling with the disease control rate of 94% and the objective response rate of 44%. So that's all really somewhat exciting news for a second line therapy. When looking at the end of the trial, nine patients were still on the treatment, which is great, and 13 patients had received more than six months of therapy. When you look at the median progression-free survival, those that have FGFR2 altered cholangiocarcinoma, the median progression-free survival is 5.98 months. Those that had refractory, the median progression-free survival was six months. And those that had the kinase domain mutation, the median progression-free survival was 6.9 months. While I've raced through this, I think the important things to take home is that the toxicity profile is more of a classical chemotherapy tox profile or tyrosine kinase toxicity profile and the benefit has been seen in overcoming acquired resistance it was generally well tolerated and what we need is probably a bigger trial to sort of confirm this and even have comparison to a standard of care drug and maybe move this to the first line somewhat like what osimertinib is in the world of lung cancer uh you took the metaphor or the simile right out of my mouth, Josh. I was thinking Ossimertinib as you were describing uh, this study. Great minds think alike, Mikey. Do we want to jump ship or do you have any questions about this trial? Not really. I completely agree with everything you've said. This very well may supersede some of the other FGFR inhibitors like Pemigatinib, which still frustratingly in Australia aren't that available. So hopefully this will be something that supercharges not just their use in clinical practice, but also our access. But yes, why don't we just crack on here because I'm going to talk about a pancreas study. I know there was a pancreas study at ESMO and more to the point, it was a pancreas study that Josh and I have actually been crying out for on multiple episodes of this show. This is the GENERATE study, a multi-centered, randomized, open-label, three-arm, phase 2 slash 3 trial that compares nabpaclitaxel and gemcitabine with modified fulfirinox. This is the answer to the question that so many people have been asking. Nabpac and gemcitabine and fulfirinox have been sort of growing in parallel, but there's never been a head-to-head trial. The study was based in Japan, so at risk of sounding like this is just an add-on, there was also a third arm of S1 Erox, which is Fulfirinox, but with the 5-FU substituted with S1, which is a similar drug that is not available in Australia. The background is that Gemabraxane and modified Fulfirinox are both recommended for first-line treatment for patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. There's no direct comparison as mentioned. There was the Napoli 3 study, which Josh and I covered earlier this year, that demonstrated superiority of Nelirifox over Gemabraxane. s Erox demonstrated promising activity in a recent phase 1b study, and so Generate aimed to compare these three regimens. The study originally aimed to have 732 patients enrolled, but for various reasons, 527 were eventually enrolled and 426 were analysed. Key inclusion criteria were metastatic or recurrent pancreatic cancer. Histology had to be either adeno or adenosquamous carcinoma, eco performance status of 0 to 1, age between 20 and 75 years, no prior treatment for metastatic or recurrent disease, and for the phase 2 portion, which has already been read out so I won't talk about it too much, have at least one measurable lesion. Patients were randomized one to one to one into the three arms, that's nabpaclitaxel plus gem, modified fulfirinox or s erox, and patients were treated until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. The primary endpoints were overall survival, and the secondary endpoints were progression-free survival, overall response rate, adverse events, and the degree of dose intensity, so dose modifications, dose cessations, that sort of thing. 
There was a pre-planned interim analysis in March 2023, once 50% of patients were enrolled. However, and this is where it gets interesting and a little controversial, the trial was terminated early for futility. What does that mean? Well, before we jump into that, let's just quickly talk about the patient demographics. Nothing really to see here, aside from noting that this was, as mentioned, a multi-centre Japanese study. So you're only looking at one ethnic population. And there was a slight imbalance in the proportion of patients who were female. So in the napaclitaxel gemcitabine group, 50.6% of patients were female. In the modified fulfirinox group, 40.6%. And in the s group, 36.4%. What does this mean? Does it have any effect on the eventual results? No one really knows, no one really can say, but it is something that is worth noting. In terms of results, so the reason for treatment discontinuation was overwhelmingly due to progressive disease in all three arms. In terms of discontinuation due to adverse events, which is obviously pertinent given we're dealing with triplets, 23.9% of patients in the NAPPAC arm discontinued due to AEs compared with 34.3% in the Folferinox arm and 29.5% in the s arm. In terms of overall survival, I will speak about the most recent data, which was in May of this year. The median overall survival for the nabpaclitaxel plus gem cytobine cohort was 17 months, compared with 14 months with the modified fulfirinox arm, with a hazard ratio of 1.29, and 13.6 months in the s erox arm, with a hazard ratio also of 1.29. At a earlier pre-specified analysis, the predictive probability for achieving superiority of either Fulfirinox or s over the uh, napaclitaxel control was 0.73 and 0.48%, so almost nothing, and that's why the trial was terminated early. The overall response rate was similar across the two arms, although it was numerically higher in the s arm at 42.4% compared to 32% in the Fulfirinox arm and 35% in the napaclitaxel arm. The disease control rate was 83.4% in the napac arm, 72.9% in the Fulfirinox arm and 81.8% in the s arm. There were no new safety signals, although it was noted it was interesting to note that there were high rates of hematological toxicity in the NAPAC arm, which is not something that I've seen in clinical practice. NAPACLITAXL tends to be a little bit less hard on the old bone marrow than triplet. So to conclude, contrary to popular conception and popular opinion, this study demonstrates that NAPACLITAXL plus gemcitabine is not inferior to modified fulfirinox, and this highlights the pitfalls of cross-trial comparisons. This is a large multi-centre study, but it does carry a number of questions. As I mentioned, it was a Japan-only study, so are there population factors in play? We know specifically with uh, Asian patients, and I think specifically Japanese patients, that the way they metabolize 5-FU-based chemotherapies is different. Could factors such as that be coming into play? Also worth noting that the survival of the napaclitaxel arm is much higher than has been seen in previous evidence. So the control arm is really overperforming in this study. Why is the obvious question. For reference, the overall survival, according to a meta-analysis by Kim et al. in 2017, ranged from 8.7 to 13 months across various studies. So yes, we do have an answer to this timeless question, Josh, but it's probably not the answer, unfortunately. No, it's probably not the answer, but I think it would help guide clinicians to potentially de-escalate in this setting when you're kind of trying to look at tox and benefit where it might be futile. And yes, maybe it's it's not the answer that it's only a Japan-only study and there's obviously those questions, but it might be as close as we can get to having the real answer. It might be. It would be interesting to see a international phase three study examine this question. I guess, as we've said previously, in Australia, this probably doesn't change our practice because you can only get nabpaclitaxel in the first line setting. So we were using it as a matter of necessity anyway, but it does potentially mean there are fewer caveats when we're trying to sell this to patients. But why don't we power on and speak about the final study, which is the Gemstone 303 study. 
a little bit like this podcast. So what a gem. So if you like it, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear about any specific topic, please drop us a line and don't forget to rate and subscribe. <laughs> okay, I'll move on. You just so talk- you just can't can't resist, can you? No, you just set me up so nicely, Michael. Moving on to Gemstone 303. This was a pre-specified progression-free survival and overall survival final analysis of a phase three study looking at sugar malamab, which is a pd one inhibitor, plus chemotherapy versus chemotherapy in treatment naive, advanced gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma. Is it really called sugar malamab? Sugar malamab. That's amazing. It really does yeah. roll off the tongue. It does. It does. So background is sugar malamab is a pdl one targeted immunoglobulin. And there was a phase 1B study that showed that this drug plus chemotherapy had promising results in this advanced setting with objective response rate of about 62% and median PFS and OS 8.3 in 17 months respectively. What is this conversation about? It is the phase 3 study. So it's actually going to give us some real answers looking at sugar malamab plus CAPOX versus CAPOX alone. So that's CAPE cytopin and oxaliplatin in those with unresectable locally advanced or metastatic disease. The trial, they were randomized one-to-one. They had to have untreated and unresectable disease, no known HER2 positive status, which I already don't like. We should know what their HER2 status is as part of a baseline testing panel. And their PDL one had to be above 5% with a good EGPOG performance status. And they were randomized to one of those two arms. These were continued until the classic disease progression, unacceptable toxicity. Stratification criteria include PD-1 expression and ECOG, with the primary endpoints being PFS and overall survival and a variety of secondary endpoints. Michael, I'm already a little bit, not bemused with this study, but it's another immunotherapy agent that's looking at exactly the same thing as prior immunotherapy agents and I wonder if you had a comment about that before I move on. I suspect that this is not necessarily a study that much like Generate it's because of our PBS system it's not going to change how we access drugs and what treatment options we have in Australia but for other countries that have a slightly different setup where you know the more options you have the better this may just be another thing to add to the pile. Potentially. And so when we look at this, so 241 patients were in the intervention arm, 238 patients in the control arm. At the end of the trial design, 12% were ongoing in the intervention and 4% in the KPOX. Reason for discontinuation, predominantly disease progression, 58% in the immunotherapy and 71% in the chemotherapy arm. Median age from a demographic perspective in the 60s and 70 plus percent were men. ECOG performance was generally one with 70% in both arms and about 50% had a PDL1 of greater than 10% and 46% had a PDL1 of 5 to 9%. Looking at the overall survival data, this was a statistically significant study with a median overall survival being 15.64 months versus 12.65 months with a hazard ratio of 0.75. At the 24-month analysis or interim analysis, 29.9% were alive versus 23% in the control arm. Now, something quite interesting happened during this talk. The presenter said that all subgroups benefit, benefited from the intervention arm, and I would, in fact, disagree with this statement. I know this is lowly me talking, Michael, but if you zoom in... Very controversial, Josh. Controversial. She said it twice, the forest plot. It's like, okay, I understand there are small numbers, but if they're under the age of 65, it crosses a confidence interval. If they've got an ECOG of zero, it crosses a confidence interval. If they've had prior treatment, look, that's tiny numbers, but it crosses the confidence interval. And I'm just like, maybe they've had a different pre-specified analysis, and that's why they've called it statistically significant. But there was quite a number of this forest plot that actually did cross the hazard ratio. So I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, it's always hard to draw definitive conclusions from this, I guess, mainly because while we have had hazard ratios on these forest plots, we never have p-values. So we don't know know how, how statistically significant these individual groups are. 
And if you clump them all together, you probably do get a statistically significant benefit. Look, you do. I think also the percentages were very much skimmed over the slide and I'm like, but I want to know. I needs to know. Uh, moving. <laughs> this is why we would always like to see these in these presentations in published form. There's only so much you can, so much information you can impart when you have between three and five minutes. Oh, exactly, exactly. And if you look at the progression-free survival, also statistically significant with a hazard ratio of 0.66 and other results, objective response rate 68% versus 52%, complete response similar, um, partial response quite similar as well, and stable disease you saw more in the control arm, but overall if you look at the numbers they were quite similar. The median duration of response was much better in the intervention arm of 6.8 versus 4.6 months. Adverse events leading to death, there was two in the intervention arm and three in the control arm with the highest adverse events being from the chemotherapy, being anemia, platelet and neutropenia. So look, in conclusion, this is a statistically significant study with Capox plus sugamalumab demonstrating statistical difference in overall survival and meaningful improvement in progression-free survival, which is great for those with metastatic gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma. I just wish they compared it to nivolumab or pembrolizumab or a MAB or something that would give me, you know, supremacy data, which is a terrible phrase, but a non-inferiority data between one and the other, because I think this is becoming really important. It's becoming a crowded uh, field without any real answers. Yes, if I'm going to play a devil's advocate here, though, Josh, I will say that there is still a little bit of controversy as to when immunotherapy is used, given the CPS data in the Checkmate 648 and 649s. We know that the benefit of immunotherapy is significantly less when you have a low pd one CPS. And from listening to other other presenters, there was another study, the Spotlight study, that gave some updated data, which was a novel non-immunotherapy-related MAB targeting a new sort of cellular target. But that was their justification for using chemo alone as a control group rather than chemo, chemo IO because um, their population actually turned out to be mostly pdl one low. And it seems like some people aren't using IO necessarily for every patient. That's what we do in Australia, but uh, it doesn't seem to be a universal thing. It's an interesting point, Michael. I just feel that we now have three immunotherapy agents which are statistically significant. We don't have any better biomarkers to tell who's going to respond and who's not. And I think as the years go by and as our healthcare system comes under immense pressure to provide these treatments, there's only going to be one winner. There's going to be one winner, and I suspect that the winner in places like Australia or the UK, where it's the government that's footing the bill for the majority of these very expensive treatments, it's going to be due to factors that aren't necessarily based on the evidence. It's going to be related to financial considerations, timing considerations. And, you know, like anything, there's uh, pros and cons of this approach. That's it, especially considering the PFS and OS data for this particular trial is better than Nivolumab or Pembro. But we might leave it there, otherwise Michael and I will debate this all night long and realistically Probably, disagree yeah. with each other. So tomorrow, tomorrow we're going to look at skin and following that we will probably dive into colorectal. But we've got so much more to cover and so little time, so we'll see you then. Rest assured, it'll all be coming into your earbuds via a streaming service near you. So no matter what the order is, there will be plenty more content from Esmo. Thank you for listening to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind. You'll find previous episodes on our website, along with weekly posts resources, and links to our Twitter and LinkedIn pages. Check it out at inquisitiveonk.com. That's inquisitiveonk.com.